Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 3rd, 2010, and my guest is David Kennedy of Stanford University. He's the author of many books, including Freedom from Fear, the American People in Depression and War, 1929 through 1945. David, welcome to Econ Talk. I'm glad to be here. I want to start by talking about the Great Depression and bring our conversation forward to the present economic and political situ situation. If we have time at the end, I want to talk about the nature of history. Starting with the Great Depression, the 1930s, one view of the Great Depression is that Hoover stood by doing nothing as the economy collapsed, paralyzed by his free market principles. Roosevelt came to the rescue with the New Deal, saved the economy and democracy. What's true and false about this view? Well, that view does capture a lot of our folkloric understanding of that uh, passage in our history. <clears throat> the fact is that uh, Herbert Hoover was the legatee of, of the old early 20th century progressive tradition. He cast his first presidential ballot for the Bull Moose Party of Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. He served in Woodrow Wilson's cabinet as the wartime food administrator. Uh, he was sought by both parties as a progressive presidential candidate in 1920, ended up becoming or declaring himself a Republican. But he was very much, uh, very much inherited that progressive era uh, impulse to try to use the power of government to solve social and economic problems or to address them commensurately with their gravity as they presented themselves in the 20th century. And, and part of the progressive agenda was to build governmental institutions that were on a scale that equaled what the economy and the society had become since the Constitution was written in the 18th century. So interestingly, uh, Hoover's very first uh, act as president in 1929, after his inaugural in March of 1929, <clears throat> well before the depression that appeared on the horizon, was to call a special session of Congress, um, an emergency session, something quite uh, out of the ordinary. And its purpose was to address what he regarded as the chronic, by then nearly decade old, depression in agriculture. And the agricultural sector had been deeply depressed since world commodity markets recovered after uh, World War I. Uh, what we know historically as the Great Depression, which is usually, the, the onset is usually <clears throat> dated to the stock market crash of 1929. That was old news in the American countryside by 1929 because uh, virtually all uh, farm prices had been drastically depressed for the decade. So this is just one sign of his, uh, you might say, progressive instincts, is that he, he really wanted to use whatever power there was in the federal government to address these problems. So when the Depression came, the first thing you have to remember is that nobody, and I mean nobody, in the first months, or even I would say the first almost two years of that event, knew that what they were witnessing was what we know is the capital G, capital D, Great Depression. Um, if, if we think of our current economic uh, Great Recession as a black swan, a phrase that's now become almost a cliche, the Great Depression was the biggest and baddest black swan ever. To this day, it's regarded as a singularity in economic history, nothing really approaching it. So the people who live, we remember that history is remembered backward, but it's lived forward. And people don't have the advantage of seeing into the future the way we see into the past. So Hoover and his contemporaries thought that they were witnessing yet another of these cyclical downturns in the economy. They'd had uh, a severe one in 1920 that didn't last very long. That's right. And Herbert Hoover had been Secretary of Commerce in that earlier uh, recession, 1920-21. And he had taken the lead in uh, using what power the government had, it wasn't much, but some, to persuade uh, employers, for example, to maintain payrolls and not lay off people, maybe reduce hours but not fire people, to maintain demand and consumption in the economy. And indeed, that recession was turned around relatively quickly, uh, at least in the industrial and urban sector, not in the agricultural sector. <clears throat> so uh, Hoover had good reason to believe that this was another uh, crisis or another event on that scale and of that general nature, and that remedies that he'd tried as Secretary of Commerce earlier in the decade would probably be effective. So he jawboned. He called industrial leaders in, financial leaders and so on, and tried to persuade them to liquefy the banking system and to maintain employment roles and, 
you're a treasurer. You leaned on the banks. In your book, you talk about how he leaned on the banks to create an emergency loan fund for yes, the banks. Yes, he encouraged private banks to come together and create a pool to bail out their weaker sisters. Which they'd often done in yes. the past. Yeah, J.P. Morgan yeah. had led uh, uh, initiatives of that kind in the 1890s and the early 1900s. So these, again, were, these were relatively well-proven uh, methods for dealing with an ordinary downturn in the business cycle. And Hoover took the lead, and he was he was widely regarded in the press in 1930 and even into 1931 as the lead figure in the battle against this economic downturn. Now, as we know, because we have the advantage of hindsight, um, the thing got away from him terribly, and it became a much grander, greater, bigger, catastrophic crisis than anybody had really uh, thought they saw coming. And he proved inadequate to that phase of the thing. But it's also worth noting that in a significant way, so did Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt's inaugurated in March of 1933. And eight years later, the unemployment rate is still about 15%. It was 25% when he came into office. So yes, there's some improvement. But getting rid of the depression uh, down to zero or virtually zero unemployment and getting the economy fully working again eluded him until World War II came along. So the, the standard history of Hoover as a failure and Roosevelt as a great success on strictly economic grounds, that is strictly in terms of counterpunching to the Great Depression, is uh, distorted on both sides. Hoover did indeed take some pretty strong initiatives, and Roosevelt, for his part, never did fully pull the country out of the Depression. And as you explain in the book, when the economy worsened sharply in, in 31 and 32, Hoover got more aggressive. Uh, sometimes he made mistakes, as did Roosevelt, went in the wrong direction, did things that he thought would be useful. But they, he was very aggressive, certainly for his day, yes. in his response in, in terms of uh, um, tariff policy, which backfired horribly on him. But he yeah. thought, either for political <clears throat> reasons, why don't you comment on that, actually, because we've done a, a podcast on, on Sweet Hawley. Why don't you talk about uh, what was the mix of political and economic thinking Hoover had in mind when he supported that, when he signed Well, in, in that same uh, emergency session of Congress that, uh, that Hoover called to deal with the uh, chronic agricultural crisis, uh, that same Congress uh, ran away with the agenda and enacted the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which Hoover, to his discredit, did sign, right. but he didn't like it, and he, he certainly did not initiate it. And indeed, it, it uh, cut across the grain of what he believed was the root cause of the depression itself was the was the in the disruption of international trade and international capital markets international exchange rates currency exchange rates uh, in the great disruption that uh, that was the aftermath of world war 1 so the, the the biggest single difference between hoover and roosevelt in terms of their understanding of what had caused this crisis was that roosevelt apparently chose to believe that this was an all american crisis and it should be addressed exclusively within an American context. Hoover believed, and I think most economic historians would probably agree with him on balance, that this was a global crisis, an international crisis, and it required some kind of an international address if it was going to be successfully dealt with. And he, he tried, Hoover, in fact, tried several times to get Roosevelt to get on board with that analysis of the Depression and then all the countermeasures that would follow from that analysis. Uh, during the, the so-called interregnum between the time of Roosevelt's election and his inaugural, which was an extraordinary five-month period when the, the government was essentially headless because the outgoing president was a lame duck and the new one hadn't been inaugurated yet. But uh, Hoover uh, never succeeded in persuading Roosevelt of those things, and the United States, like every other major country, proceeded to go its own way on nationalistic and autarkic grounds to try to deal with the crisis on its own. As a historian... Why do you think that caricature of Hoover is sort of the grade school and for many people the only picture they have of him? Well, look, at the end of the day, you cannot avoid the conclusion that Hoover's was a failed presidency. Right. I and mean, he failed rather spectacularly to yep. get a grip on the major issue of the time, which was the, the, the onset of the Great Depression. Uh, so that's the fundamental explanation, I think, of why he's remembered so badly. Uh, there are some others. Uh, the Democratic Party, um, the National Party, hired a publicist in uh, 1932 uh, named Charles Mickelson, whose job it was to demonize Hoover in the course of the campaign when he was running against Roosevelt. 
And Mickelson was very, very successful. He, he was a the brilliant. first negative campaign uh, in American history, no doubt, and the last one until just recently. Well, I'm not sure it was the first <laughs> first negative campaign, but I don't think it was close. So, some of these things go back to, to, to Thomas back to Jefferson. Jefferson's day. Sure. No, he had a much harder time. I but think. the uh, but it was very effective, and it it, it it forever left this impression in the popular memory of Hoover as this moss back do nothing, laissez faire conservative who simply would not budge in the face of this great crisis. Uh, now, the, uh, I, my own belief is that as time went on, uh, Hoover got more and more crotchety and curmudgeonly in his later years and said a lot of, in my opinion, very impolitic things. It even contradicted some of his own earlier beliefs about the role of government and so on. And that added to this caricature of him as this, this, this irretrievable, um, uh, troglodytic mm -hmm. uh, conservative. Uh, as you point out, Roosevelt... Although the economy did very well in the early part of his first administration, uh, unemployment proved pretty stubborn, and it spiked again in 1938 uh, with what we would today call the double dip uh, recession. I don't know what they called it then, but uh, well, they called it the Roosevelt recession. Uh -huh. sure. Well, that's what the Republicans <laughs> called it, no doubt. Did what were Roosevelt's uh, political prospects at that point? Again, we have hindsight; we, we see him as this masterful politician four consecutive victories. But in 1938, he was, uh, he was not as popular as he ended up being, and certainly after his death. No, and, and in fact, the, the event that seems to mark uh, the, the significant decline of, of Roosevelt's rather charmed presidential popularity uh, occurred almost immediately after his second inaugural in early 19, January 1937, when he announced this plan to uh, uh, augment the membership of the Supreme Court, right. the so-called court packing plan. Uh, and though it might be too much to say that's the event that caused him to lose popularity and lose the, the real power of that New Deal coalition he put together, it's a pretty good marker of uh, people seized on that event as a way to explain or rationalize their opposition to any further New Deal experimentation. So <clears throat> there, there, a, a significant conservative bloc emerged in the Congress in 1937, 1938, rallied around <coughs> the, uh, the court packing plan. They probably had a lot of other deeper reasons for being opposed to Roosevelt, but that gave them a very convenient uh, rallying point. So yes, uh, by 1930, late 37, 38, Roosevelt begins to look like a two-term president. In fact, there had never been anything other than a two-term right. or one-term president. There had never been a third-term president. And indeed, the best polling data we have, which isn't great because the polling was a very in 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 an even more inexact <laughs> science in that day than it is today, <clears throat> but the best polling data that we have seems pretty strongly to suggest that had it not been for the great crisis of World War II in, in 1939, 1940, particularly the, 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 the surrender of France to the Nazis in June of 1940, that Roosevelt might well not have won uh, election to a third term. But there was so much anxiety about the international scene at that point, that, and he stepped forward then as a foreign policy leader, national security leader, and a lot of people didn't want to change horses in midstream uh, in that kind of a circumstance. And he was a masterful politician, and particularly as a leader in wartime. Right? I think he's, I have my, my uh, disagreements with his policies as an economist, but um, as a leader under the stress of, of the threat of war, he was pretty effective. Well, I think that's right, and, and that's among the reasons why even to this day, 60, 70 years on, <clears throat> World War II is still enshrined in our collective memory as yeah. the Good War, not least of all because of the way he fought it, the way he defined it to the public, uh, the way he um, defined its objectives and its purposes, and the means that he used to actually get to victory. So, yeah, I think we, we should rightly give him a lot of credit for that. I can't help but think <coughs> of the fact that uh, his monument and his memorial in Washington, D.C., which is extremely large, by the way, in terms of acreage. It's, it covers a lot of ground. Uh, it's a low monument uh, that uh, tries to capture all of his uh, different parts of his different administrations. There, there are three things I love about it. One is he's shown in a wheelchair, something that in his life he was very careful not to be seen. He, he was not in the original uh, version of that monument. Correct. He is not smoking and he was an ardent smoker. But the third <laughs> thing that I always, that is subtler, that those I think got a lot of public discussion, but there's a great quote about his pacifism. <laughs> he was very eager, of course, to take America into war, perhaps rightfully, most Americans thought so, think so now. 
But uh, he certainly wasn't a pacifist. Uh, but there's a great quote about the, the evils of war and weapons and very, very politically correct monument. Is that the quote where he says, I have seen war, I hate war? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Well, he is referring to a very whirlwind uh, inspection tour he made as Assistant Secretary of the Navy to the Western Front in 1918, and he, he saw war from a great sanitary distance, to, to be <laughs> sure. So it's not exactly that he'd had his uh, boots down in the trenches, you know. Um, the thing I like about that monument, since we're on the subject, yeah. is that of all the presidential monuments in Washington, D.C., it's the one that, in my, to my eye at least, is least about a person and more about an era. And it is. About it's the got whole, history in it. The, the whole historical context yeah. in which the person operated. It's absolutely true. Yeah. The part I find sort of amusing about those three things, I always think about it because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Jefferson Memorial was built during the Roosevelt, one of the Roosevelt administrations, and the quotes that were chosen for it seem to be suggestive of the flexibility of the Constitution, which, of course, Trevor said at time must have said something like that. But, you know, Roosevelt built that memorial to serve his political ends, and so modern politicians do the same with him. It's a little bit of justice there, perhaps. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I like to mention on this program that that stereotype that I <coughs> opened with, this Hoover did nothing, Roosevelt saved us with the New Deal, has since been supplanted, I think, among pundits at least, in the general public as along the lines that you said, that, well, the New Deal didn't work quite as well as maybe we thought it did. Uh, the recovery was actually quite disappointing. It was the war that got us out of the Depression. And some economists dispute that. I'm curious what your take on it is. Well, first of all, amongst historians, uh, th th there's, there's no headline in the statement that the New Deal did not end the Great Depression, that it took World War II to do that. This, this has been uh, understood clearly since the 1930s. Uh, so this, uh, so much uh, recent scholarship, or at least punditry, has this air about it. Now it can be told, yeah, for sure. which I think is really badly mistaken. It, it really presumes a degree of ignorance amongst the readers of these things that uh, is not justified. <clears throat> but look, there, there's, a, um, there's a deeper story here, it seems to me. And I'm going to try to develop a little thesis here briefly about it. Um, Go for it. That maybe you're, some people might think is a little bit over the top. But I think I can make a case that Roosevelt's top priority was not ending the Depression as soon as possible. That his top priority was to use this moment of great political, social, cultural, ideological disruption, malleability, to accomplish reforms that he had thought well before the Depression ever came along were necessary to make modern American life viable. And the, there's a single word that uh, sums up all of that objective and that program. Uh, the word is famous to us, not least of all because it's in the title of the single most famous piece of legislation that comes down to us in that era is the Social Security Act. And security, it seems to me, unmistakably, is the touchstone and the core of everything that he wanted to accomplish. To take the risk out of unemployment, take the risk out of old age, take the risk out of mortgage lending, take the risk out of securities trading, or at least reduce the risk in all these sectors, and to make American life across the board for individuals and institutions more predictable, more stable, and less susceptible to these wild ups and downs that have been characteristic of the American economy since the early 19th century, since the United States entered the Industrial Revolution era. Uh, and he got a lot of that accomplished. And Small amounts that grew. Yes, I mean, he yeah. got Social Security he got started, accomplished. Yeah. He, he established the Securities and Exchange Commission. He passed unemployment insurance. Uh, created he, Fannie Mae. He created Fannie Mae. He created the Federal Housing Authority, uh, which those things worked very well for half a century. They lately haven't served us too well, but they worked very well for two or three generations. So the first thing I think you have to keep in mind is when you're passing judgment on Roosevelt is trying to remember what his real priorities were. And ending the Depression in a hurry, I think, was not one of them. And, and I, though I can't prove this with the kind of really hard documentary evidence that uh, I might like to find, there is a document, I think, that goes a long way toward convincing me that I've got this right. And it's Roosevelt's second inaugural address in January of 1937, when he says something absolutely extraordinary in the annals of presidential speeches. He's, being re, re, he's been re-elected. He's been inaugurated for the second time. <clears throat> he begins the speech by talking about how much progress there has been out of the depths of the Depression when he came into office in 1933. He's bragging, boasting, as you would expect any political leader would, about the things he's, got, he's accomplished. 
And then he says something just absolutely astonishing if you read the text of the speech. I think I can quote it just about verbatim. He says, but these signs of returning prosperity could be portents of political disaster. Hmm. Now that, that is a truly astonishing thing for a president to say. Sure. Prosperity could be politically disastrous. And it's then, sure. immediately after that, is when he gets off this line that uh, many people know, they've heard it, but many people don't get the context. He says, I see one third of a nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished, and so on. He's not talking, in the, in the context of that speech, he is not talking about the transient victims of this passing crisis of the Depression. In his mind, he's just painted a picture where the Depression is lifting and things are improving, but he sees this one third of a nation that is still left out of the the, the, the core of national life, that they're, they're chronically in trouble. Those are the people he's really trying to lift into the mainstream of American life. And he's afraid that if the economy returns to normal too swiftly, he won't get that job finished. So I, I, I think he had a much deeper and more ambitious agenda than a lot of people give him credit for. And that theme runs through Democratic presidents, just like R Ronald Reagan has become the person that, that Republican nominees have to pay homage to uh, Democratic politicians, either out of respect or uh, practical uh, success, use a similar theme still to this day. The people, the haves and have-nots, the whatever it is, right? Yeah, I think that's right. I think, though it's a gross generalization, I think it's pretty uh, accurate that the, the Democratic Party, Democratic leaders, since Roosevelt's time at least, have been of the belief that uh, there is so much potential volatility uh, in our economic system, that it is the job of government to stabilize things and buffer people against the, uh, uh, the workings of the free and unbridled market, whereas the Republican Party, by and large, is the party that wants to unlock and release entrepreneurial energy and so on, and they're a little less well, concerned with stability and security. Yeah, uh, they certainly don't talk about it as much. You know, and they certainly seem to be more interested in creative destruction, although they often don't actually do much about it. There is a... Another theme about the cause of the Great Depression I want to just mention before we go further, um, before we go further, which is the role of inequality, because you're talking about insecurity, the fact that there was economic life had been always been risky, and it was probably riskier certainly for many Mar millions of Americans in the 30s. Uh, there is a common argument made that inequality it was a cause of the Great Depression itself. Uh, what do you make of that argument? Well, that was an argument... Uh, Where does it come from? I, I think it's in a lot of high school textbooks. It seems to, to be in there. It, the, the argument that, that inequality or imbalance was the, was the term of art in the 1930s, was the root cause of the Depression in the United States, is a, a theory that was given a lot of currency in the 1950s, especially by writers like John Kenneth Galbraith and Arthur Schlesinger. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, this isn't exactly rocket science, but reading that stuff now, you can see easily and transparently how those writers were trying to use a certain narrative about the Depression and the New Deal to make uh, to, to establish their own political agenda in the 1950s and 1960s, when the war on poverty and the notion of uh, inequality, economic inequality, was front and center. Now, that's not to say that there was not inequality in the 1930s and before the 1930s. There was plenty of it. And indeed, one of the, what the, 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 the premise that underlay both Herbert Hoover's and Franklin Roosevelt's initiatives to try to restore health to the agricultural sector, which was a major sector of the economy in those days, hard, way bigger than it is today. Yeah, hard for people to relate to it today. Part of their thinking was that there's this chronic imbalance inside the American economy and American society. Farmers aren't making enough income to buy the product and the output of American factories and cities and industrial workers. And if we can restore some kind of balance to countryside and city, we'll put the whole economy on a much more prosperous and sustainable footing going forward. So, the, yeah, there was something to that. But again, if, you, if, you, if we dwell too deeply or long on that explanation, I think we miss something very important, which we were talking about just a minute ago in a sense. That is that... Uh, all explanations, if I put the matter summarily, all explanations of the Depression that dwell too exclusively inside the House of the United States are going to get the thing wrong. Because this is a global event. It's an international catastrophe. It struck the entire global economic system. The United States was but one of many sites where this uh, crisis hit. We have some share of the responsibility, but not totally. 
And this is where I think Herbert Hoover, at least at some philosophical or analytic level, had it right that the, the proper remedy for this crisis had to be international in character. And indeed, if you look at what happens in the world after 1945, the end of World War II, what does the United States do? It steps forward and creates a new international order with institutions in it that didn't exist in the pre-war world, like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which becomes the World Trade Organization eventually. Uh, there is a very conscious and deep recognition amongst lots of policymakers that the, the international environment, economic environment simply had to be better integrated, better monitored, better managed, had to have more institutional structure in it than had been the case in the 1930s if the world economy was not to go south again. And certainly monetary policy, which is tangled up in, in the gold standard and the exchange rate regimes that emerged, that were in place before the war and certainly after the war, which were different, uh, certainly there's a recognition they, play, they played a crucial role uh, that would also vindicate Hoover to some extent in, the, in that it was a international problem. Uh, I don't think we fully understand monetary policy, uh, but we're, we know some things we didn't know then, certainly, that made it harder. Uh, let's talk about the parallels between those times and these. Um, I'm sure you get more phone calls in the last year or two than you did the year or two before that. People <laughs> want to write, ask questions like this. Uh, what have we, what have we learned? What do we learn from that era that's useful to understand today? Uh, one of which, uh, as you're talking, hits me very strongly, which is the uh, history's lived forward. You know, we're, we're standing right now either on the brink of a modest recovery or something worse. We really have no idea. Get people screaming in all directions. But uh, what are your thoughts on the, the relevance of that of the 30s for the, what we're living through now? Well, you're you're right. Until a couple of years ago, uh, most of the people that I encountered thought the Great Depression was about as relevant an historical topic as the Peloponnesian Wars. Yeah. But suddenly, it's become a, a, a reference point for all kinds of efforts to understand where we are today. So one way to, to think about that, I believe, is to uh, try to situate ourselves today at a truly comparable point to the great cycle of events in the 1930s. Now, the, the natural thing that a lot of people have been doing for the last year or more is to compare Barack Obama and Franklin Roosevelt. Sure. And again, it's understandable. They're two... And Hoover. Bush to Hoover. And Bush to Hoover. Bit. Two failed Republican yeah. conservative presidents. And Leading then the, yeah. here come these aspirationally transformative, charismatic Democratic presidents. And it, the comparison kind of makes itself or suggests yeah. itself. Sure. But the fact is, if we date the onset of the Great Depression from October of 1929, the great stock market crash, and if we date the onset of this crisis from, let's say, the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, yeah. then the proper point of comparison is not now and the spring of 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt became president. It's some date in 1931, yeah. which uh, roughly two years into the crisis. Um, when and things look things didn't like look they look all now. that bad. Yeah, yeah, not so good, but getting better a little bit. Sometimes. Actually, things, things look, 1931, things looked a little worse on all the relevant indexes than they do now, but not dramatically. But they so, didn't look dramatically worse than the onset. Is no, the is no, the rel that's is right. That's right. The, the real the real slide, the real descent down the chute into the pits of economic hell. Great. Comes at the end of 1931. <laughs> Have a nice day. So, <laughs> so if we really want to be responsible about this historical comparison, we really ought to compare matchable points in the economic cycle that we're talking about here. And that means that we still don't know, as of this moment right now, in August of 19, or pardon me, of 2010, whether we have arrested the downward slide of this economy and are on a better path than they were at comparable point in 1931, or whether we're going to suffer their fate and see a, uh, a second round of this that will really push us down even further. One difference, though, is that monetary policy issue, right? The, the central bank... Uh, in 1931 was pretty lost and, and helpless. Well, and yes. Uh, ben Bernanke's a lot more aggressive, perhaps to his own. It may turn out equally problematic. We don't know yet, but it, there is some difference there. No, I think you're absolutely right. Because the collapse of the banks is what was com a disastrous set of bank collapses. Yes. Post-31 is what set us down that spiral, right? That's right. So there was nothing like the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Uh, the bank bailouts, there was nothing that, that matches the bailouts of Freddie and Fannie and GM and so on. Right. 
Uh, so government, and, and both Republican and Democratic administrations, both Bush and Obama yeah. administrations, have clearly learned some lessons from that historical episode. And Ben Bernanke is not the only person in the administration who understands some of that history. Correct. And they, both administrations, outgoing Bush, incoming Obama, recognized the necessity, given the historical lessons of the 1930s, that government had to counterpunch early and hard against this thing if there was going to be any possibility of avoiding a truly catastrophic downturn. So, yeah, I think uh, even though I was conjuring a kind of a doomsday scenario a moment ago about the comparison between 1931 and today, I do think on balance that uh, it's, we're unlikely to have as big a crisis as we did before, uh, just because we have learned some lessons from history. And there's another point, too, in this context I think deserves to be made. <clears throat> it has to do with the international uh, scene. Yeah. That what passed for a mechanism of international economic and monetary regulation or, or equilibration in the 1930s was the gold standard. And okay. virtually everybody abandoned it. Okay. So the one thin poorly understood mechanism that worked to integrate the world economy uh, was kaput by 1931. Britain goes off the gold standard. We go off shortly thereafter. That's that. Today we have a much denser uh, 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 international environment that is much more densely populated with fu functioning institutions that work to keep the world economy more or less in sync, different national economies in sync. Uh, and we also have a history of the last 50, 60 years since post-World War II of pretty substantial international economic cooperation, the evolution yeah. of informal but still powerful things like the G8 and the G20. Yeah. We've developed habits of international economic cooperation that simply were not there to anything like the same degree in the 1920s and going into the 1930s. Uh, I recently heard an address by Jean-Claude Trichet, the head of the European Central Bank, and the, the, his talk was all about how closely uh, he and the other uh, central bankers of the world, including the Fed, Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, had consulted on a daily basis yeah. as this crisis was really gathering steam in 2008 and 2009. So there's nothing comparable to that uh, in the earlier scenario. So we, we live in a world that uh, understands the, the, the character of its own interdependence and interrelationships better than people did at that time. And we've evolved ways of, of dealing with that. So you talked about the necessity <coughs> that both Bush and Obama recognized of a strong government counterpunch. And yet about 800 <coughs> yards from here, John Taylor's office at, over at, at Hoover is, he's, an, he's a very outspoken critic of both the Bush and the Obama interventions. There are similar uh, respected voices coming out of Harvard uh, Alex Alcina, Robert Barrow. Uh, so two questions. Well, one question. We have this feeling, I do, that when Roosevelt intervened so creatively <clears throat> for his time and took a bunch of steps that were unprecedented, some were extensions of what Hoover did, but in much larger measures, you have the feeling everyone just said, yeah, well, it's, we got to try this because after all, it's a depression. Um, and that only kooks and, and, you know, people who saw Roosevelt as a red stood up to him intellectually. Was there much of an intellectual backlash on free market principles against uh, Hoover, uh, excuse me, Roosevelt's policies, and maybe Hoover's, I don't know. Well, the, 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 the really systematic articulation of a, a critique of Roosevelt and Rooseveltian policies <clears throat> really awaited the end of World War II and the immediate post-war period works like uh, Frederick Hayek's The Road to Serfdom and later Milton Friedman's sure. Capitalism and Freedom and so on. <clears throat> There's a kind of inchoate and, and political and polemical opposition to Roosevelt that again is largely lost to memory because it was a minority and it was pretty ineffective in the 1930s. But modern, or a, a big element in modern day conservatism, the modern day Republican Party really crystallizes at that moment in the 1930s when elements of the Republican Party take on the basic character of being against big government. That, that was not anything like as, as well identified a partisan position for either party uh, before the 1930s. And again, the reason isn't hard to see. Government gets bigger. <laughs> yeah, so a lot bigger, pe yeah. People start getting worried about maybe it's too big and it's encroaching on traditional freedoms, some of which aren't always well understood. Um, what People don't understand what they're talking about when they use that phrase. But yeah, um, the, um, there was opposition to, to Roosevelt, to be sure. <clears throat> uh, but it was, as I say, it was confined to a, a kind of an inchoate minority that really didn't have a, 
solid intellectual rationale for why they felt that way until the post-war period. Then, then they acquire it. If, if the blogosphere had been invented and Fox News, uh, Roosevelt would have had as hard a time as Obama has had getting his stuff through, maybe. But uh, on a more serious note, talk about the political skills of Roosevelt. Uh, you know, I, I think his, most economists would say his economic success, even in people who like Roosevelt would say it was a mixed bag. Uh, but his political skills were very strong. So talk about why he's important politically and uh, what you see in, in President Obama that's similar or perhaps different. Well, Roosevelt was, in his time, uh, to, to borrow a phrase, a great communicator. Yeah. Uh, he mastered, to a degree that no one before him had, this fairly new medium of the radio as a tool of political appeal and of governance, really. <clears throat> radio had been around for about a decade before he became president. Uh, Herbert Hoover had campaigned on the radio in 1928, and again, 32, they both did. But Hoover and, and Coolidge and Hardy never really figured out how to use the medium in a way that would was really effective. Uh, Roosevelt did. And the, among other things, the so-called fireside chats were just a stroke of political and communications and public relations genius to use this new medium of the radio to cultivate a sense of intimacy uh, with uh, the public at large. There's a wonderful anecdote that I heard recently that illustrates this. <coughs> At Roosevelt's funeral in 1945, as the funeral cortege was making its way through the streets of Washington, there was an old man weeping. And somebody said, you, you seem so affected. Did, did you know the president? And the man replied, no, I didn't know him, but he knew me. Uh, and, it, that, and it's an anecdote, line, to be sure. Yeah. But it tells so, us something really uh, uh, important about the way Roosevelt related to the public at large. And he did that, not least of all, through the mechanism of the radio. So that was, that was one piece of, of communications genius that he, he mastered early on. But there, there was a lot of method to this, too, and we shouldn't just uh, chalk it up to uh, it's a good voice, yeah. inspirational <laughs> a good delivery, yeah. moments of inspiration. <laughs> For example, the, uh, the great immigrant communities that entered this country in the very late 19th century and early 20th century, the so-called new immigration, as people that came from southern and eastern Europe, they were Orthodox and Jewish and Catholic and Polish and, and Italian and Bulgarian and so on. Uh, they differed culturally, religiously, linguistically, and so on from these earlier uh, Anglo-Saxon, German, Scandinavian, North European immigrant streams. And their political loyalties were not very well set uh, as the Great Depression came along. Uh, to a certain degree, they weren't very politicized. They didn't, they didn't vote commensurate with their numbers. Yeah. And their vote, to make 11. Their, yeah, and their vote <laughs> tended to be up for grabs between the two parties. They weren't firmly in the, the camp of either party. Roosevelt understood this, and he understood that here was a constituency or a potential constituency that he could mobilize politically and attach to the Democratic Party for at least another generation, which he did. That's the core of the fabled New Deal coalition that dominates national politics well into the 1960s. It's a 30-year-long political cycle at least. And it's built on labor and trade unions and these ethnic communities that really entered the political scene in the 1930s under Roosevelt's tutelage. And here's a, here's a number that really tells us how calculating and shrewd and deliberate this policy was. The three Republican presidents who preceded Roosevelt, that's Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, over their 12 years in office, appointed exactly eight Catholics to the federal bench in 12 years. In Roosevelt's first eight years in office, just down to 19... Uh, 41, he appointed over 50 Catholics to the federal bench. Well, that's, that's not a coincidence, not, a, yeah. not an accident. He was deliberately reaching out to those communities, these, these immigrant communities especially, and cultivating their loyalty and attaching their loyalty not just to him personally, but to the Democratic Party, and it worked. The, uh, it worked so much that uh, the, 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 one of the, the reciprocals of this uh, development was the joke that used to circulate in the 1950s and the 60s, was that the Episcopal Church was the Republican Party at prayer. Mm -hmm. That, the, that the, the, the great Catholic communities had all uh, found their way Jews in the Democratic also, Party sure. and stayed there. And Jews, yeah. Now that changes in the 60s. And in fact, George W. Bush, I believe, is the first Republican to get a majority of the Catholic vote since Roosevelt's day uh, in the election of 2004. So that coalition eventually unravels. But it was very deliberately cultivated by Roosevelt in his time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ironic to think of Catholics being associated with immigration, but of course, Poles and Italians were, they were, <coughs> that was a new phenomenon, yes. the magnitude of, of, those, uh, of those folks. 
Uh, we had a podcast uh, recently with Daniel O'Kren about prohibition, and you talk a little bit in the book about what prohibition did to the Democratic Party. Talk about how that changed as prohibition ended and Roosevelt took advantage of it. But the Democratic Party was extremely ineffective, as you say, for 12 years. They they lost the White House after Wilson, um, and prohibition was one reason. Yeah. Well, prohibition, uh, the, the repeal of prohibition had a lot of appeal to various segments in the Democratic Party. It's one of these complicated political issues that appeal to different people in different ways. A lot of the ethnic groups that were on their way into the Democratic Party and that uh, had old world drinking habits and felt very put upon by prohibition, uh, it really uh, prohibited them from exercising cultural rights and, and practices that they'd inherited from generations before. So there, there was a lot of bad feeling in those communities about prohibition through the 1920s. A lot of people, a lot of immigrant communities thought this was some wasp conspiracy to deprive them of their God-given right to drink. And then on the other side, the, the conservative side of the Democratic Party, you might say, the business wing of the Democratic Party, there were people who felt that if we could bring back the excise taxes on alcohol, that that would reduce the pressure for uh, higher marginal income tax rates. Yep. So there was a kind of convergence of interest here, cultural grounds on the part of one community and economic tax revenue fiscal grounds on the part of another community. That adds up to a sufficiently large block that we get rid of prohibition. And then what did Roosevelt do besides his appeal to immigrants to sustain really a democratic majority for, for decades? Well, he also put his uh, weight behind uh, the efforts of uh, trade union leaders like John L. Lewis to, to build the trade union movement. Uh, something less than 10% of the non-farm workforce was unionized going into the Depression. Which is about what it is now. It's, it's not much <laughs> higher today. It's about 13% today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it, that we, includes government, by the way. I think in the private sector it's, it's well below 10 now. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Yes, the public employee unions yeah. are the big ones. But the, by the 1950s, the non-farm workforce is about 37 or 8 percent unionized. That's the high point. That's a, a, a development that really begins in the 1930s. So uh, it was another part of Roosevelt's strategy, uh, just on political grounds, was to attach to himself and the Democratic Party the passions and the interests of those people who are interested in strengthening the labor movement. So, and that becomes a major constituency in the party. There's a lot of overlap between that, in, those labor institutions and the ethnic and immigrant communities that we've been talking about. So these aren't necessarily separate strategies, but they're overlapping strategies. Um, though, again, it takes a while for the political payoff of this to really play itself out. Uh, the Roosevelt administration also um, gestured, at least, maybe one shouldn't put it any stronger than that, but gestured to the African-American community about its uh, friendliness to them and their interests. And there were some real substantial and concrete uh, uh, items in that. But uh, it also began to turn the black vote, such as it was, not, not many blacks were voting in the 1930s, because most still lived in the segregated South and did not have voting rights. But it starts to turn the black vote to the Democratic Party, where it remains ever since. I mean, since World War II, 90 percent or yep. so of blacks have voted for the Democratic Party. That's a great historical reversal. The, the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, the party of emancipation. Yeah. And insofar as blacks were allowed to or managed to exercise the, the franchise in the years after the Civil War and Reconstruction, they voted Republican. Um, Martin Luther King's father voted Republican, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but the, the, that, that, that's, that massively changed beginning with the New Deal. Uh, you want to put LBJ in that sequence at all? How do you see his uh, legislative agenda and, and his political strategy as part of what Roosevelt was trying to do? Well, Lyndon Johnson, I think, uh, ideologically, is very much in this, this genealogy that we've been talking about that uh, is properly understood, I think, as the, the, the godfather of it all is Franklin Roosevelt, who commits the Democratic Party to an agenda of more security and stability for more people and uh, putting a safety net or a floor underneath standards of living for more and more people, uh, bringing more people into the middle class, the mainstream of American life. That, 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 that agenda was very, very well accomplished in the post-World War II period. Incidence of homeownership, for example, goes up from about 40% in 
the 1920s to over 60% by 1960. Yeah. So that, that's a major social accomplishment for this or any other society. And I think Lyndon Johnson is in that same vein. His signature accomplishment, of course, or among his signature accomplishments, was Medicare and Medicaid. That was an un, a bit of unfinished business from the New Deal era. Indeed, it was unfinished from the progressive era. It was, it was in the Bull Moose platform in 1912, was a commitment to some kind of universal health care. In the original instructions to the drafting team that came up with the Social Security Act in 1935, their original brief uh, included instructions to come up with a plan for old age pensions, unemployment insurance, and universal health care. And Roosevelt, uh, fairly early on, concluded that if he kept the, the health care provisions in it, he risked sinking the whole bill. So he excised them before the bill ever got put into the congressional hopper. And that's why we get the Social Security bill that we do. Uh, and as recent history also instructs us, getting truly universal health care on the model that most other societies have has, for a whole host of complicated reasons, been very, very difficult in our society. But Johnson clearly is in that vein. I mean, he used to, Johnson used to say, I think of Franklin Roosevelt as my pappy, that he was the, he was the godfather of a lot of his own agenda. Um, and uh, also, of course, the other great thing, that uh, accomplishment that, uh, that uh, Lyndon Johnson is known for is uh, signing into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act yeah. of 1965, which really represent the, the first time in almost a century since Reconstruction after the Civil War that the federal government really bestirred itself in a meaningful way uh, in the name of racial equality. Uh, and Johnson knew something that Franklin Roosevelt knew, that this once the Democratic Party got attached to that, or any party, either party, got it fully attached to that issue, it was going to lose political strength in the South. And there's this uh, story, which I believe to be true, that when Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he turned to one of his aides and said, I believe we have just lost the South for at least the next generation. Well, that proved, proved true. to be yeah. absolutely accurate, that the South goes Republican, not least of all, because of uh, the legacy of the civil rights legislation of the 60s. Yeah, I think the interesting question is whether the economic security parts of those two administrations and that the whole philosophy you're talking about, the security philosophy, uh, whether they'll merely have had a good run that has to be adjusted or whether they have, it's going to be much harder to change them for the, uh, to repair them. Um, it's going to be an extraordinary interesting political time to deal with our entitlements programs and Fannie and Freddie, which as you say, quote, worked well for, you know, decades. Um, they now are so weirdly ensconced in our housing market, politicians won't even use the words Fannie or Freddie. Right. And it, it, it's an interesting challenge. The flex, we don't have a very flexible political system. It moves very slowly. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that, how that turns out. But you out. know, we, we're not alone in this. I mean, True. All, oh, yeah. All, no, the, all, all the developed <laughs> societies have uh, arguably overcommitted themselves yep. to entitlement programs. That's correct. <clears throat> and in that general picture... Uh, though it's hard for many people in this country to grasp this, we're not nearly as badly off as a lot of the countries we typically compare oh, that's ourselves correct. with. That's and and true. again, you can put a number to that. The, uh, the percentage of our GDP that goes to uh, public expenditure, that is, goes to taxes at all levels, from city and county, state, all the way up to yep. federal, is about 30%. And in most of the West European countries, it's in the 40 to 50% range. So we, we, to this day, we have a much smaller public sector than most of the advanced industrial societies that we customarily think are our sister societies. So yes, we have problems, but they're probably more soluble and of somewhat lesser scale than in places like Germany, France, Italy, Britain, and so They've on. They've got birth rate problems, labor oh. force inflexibility. They've got other challenges too. Like they're gonna have, I agree with you, I think they're gonna have a tough time. One parallel, parallel I see is something you alluded to earlier uh, between this era and the past, which is the narrative. Um, I see an immense fight today over the narrative of what caused this crisis. Uh, you know, this may turn out to be a relatively small economic tragedy. It may turn out to be something much larger. We don't know. But already economists are fighting to see who can get their story, whether it was government's fault, the market's fault. Uh, as an historian, do you find that interesting? What are your thoughts on that? Well, yes. And I, uh, as an historian, I believe in narrative. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that we are hardwired to understand the world in terms of uh, comprehensible stories. Yeah, I, agree. Um, I, I just think that's part of human psychology. Uh, 
Uh, historians have known this since the time of Herodotus and Thucydides, but yep. sometimes we have to relearn the lesson. So yeah, I think uh, a contest over the narrative of this event is a perfectly understandable uh, kind of a contest. Uh, and I think you're right that the, 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 the terms of argument have been laid down already, but the, how they're going to play out isn't altogether clear. Whether the primary responsibility lies in the unbridled abuses of the private sector or the meddling encroachments and interference and irresponsibility of the public sector. Um, I don't think we, we fully know yet how that's going to play out. You mentioned John Taylor earlier, who's a colleague and a good friend. Um, as I understand the, the heart of John's argument uh, in his highly polemical book about this, about how government caused and exacerbated the crisis, whatever the title is, um, his basic argument is that the, 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 the original sin, the, the first crime, was the, uh, the, the action of the Fed under Alan Greenspan Correct. in commodifying credit and yeah. making credit so easy for so long that it became just another commodity. And you could argue that uh, what we're witnessing is yet another in a familiar history of commodity crises, except the commodity this time happened to be credit. Yeah, could be. If he were here, he would say it's not a polemical work, it's work of economic science. Uh, but I've become skeptical of economic science, even though I respect John a great deal. Uh, well, so do I. <laughs> Um, let's turn to the, just the general question of history and narrative. Um, what works have influenced you in, in the, as, as an historian? Um, what do you think makes a great work of history, and, and what are some of the ones that, that you respect and, and try, to, try to learn from? Well, you know, when I reflect, as I sometimes do, about why I became an historian in the first place, um, this may be a self... Uh, self-glorifying narrative, but insofar as I'm able to be objective about it, I think I became an historian because I liked figuring out how things work. Yeah. And I liked explaining to myself and to others uh, how the world works, or some parts of it work. And I think narrative is just the device by which we do that. It's the way we comprehend the world, it's the way we communicate with one another about how the world works and about how we understand it. Uh, so I think crafting artful narratives that are persuasive that map onto the reality as we know it and that strike us as being plausible and even at the end of the day commonsensical, are, that's, that's the task of the historian, is to, to weave and, and, and craft those kinds of stories. As opposed to one damn thing after another, which is not well, very that's helpful. Well, that's the old complaint I often right. hear from students, that yeah. the difficulty with history is it's just one damn thing after another. If it were that simple, uh, <laughs> that's uh, my, bad my, history. <laughs> my, my, wor my working life would be a lot simpler. So, who do you like? What other historians do you like? In well, the, the historian that probably had the greatest influence on me—he uh, was my undergraduate uh, teacher—and then he, just as chance would have it, he was the chairman of the history department at Stanford many years later when I was hired to teach here. Uh, it was a guy named David Potter. And David Potter was an extraordinary teacher, an extraordinary scholar, an extraordinary human being. And he, uh, I took a course from him as an undergraduate uh, on the American character. That was the title of the course. It was not a traditional history course. It was uh, an effort to tr try to understand whether the question, is there such a thing as national character, was even a legitimate question. So the, the course was interrogating its own premises mm -hmm. on a daily basis, you might say. And I found that just fascinating, just the, the, the effort to try to find historically plausible and responsible statements about the, the enduring character of this society over a long period of historical time is the kind of question that's kept me going for uh, all my career, actually, for four decades of working in the field of history. When I wrote Freedom from Fear, I was very conscious that I was working with a uh, just a, a small slice of American history, 15, 16, 20 year period maybe. But I ad adopted a conscious practice writing that book of whenever I reached for a metaphor or an analogy, I always reached for one out of the American inventory. Hmm. And very rarely, if ever, did I reach for an analogy from somebody else's historical experience. And I was trying by that means subtly to make the point that there were deep structures to American history, and the, there were repetitive events. They're not exactly identically repetitive, yeah. but that they're in a stream of behavior that is characteristic of our society over time, and that we would do well to think that way about our society. So my listeners know that I, I worry a lot about my biases, of which I have many, uh, some of which I wear proudly. I'm curious, as an historian, uh, 
I think, again, I think there's a little romance about history the way there is about economics, which I think is misplaced in the case of economics, probably history as well, which is, oh, we're just, we're just trying to figure out what happened. We're just trying to study the data. Um, how do you keep your biases at bay? How much time do you spend when you write a book like this uh, worrying if your narrative is right? Is right even a meaningful question? Uh, well, let me take your last question uh, first. Is right a meaningful question? Historians notoriously argue with one another about what's the best way to view or interpret or understand a given event. If we didn't have those kinds of arguments, there would be no such thing as the professional or academically based study of history. It's in, on those grounds of argument that the real intellectual interest lies in what we do. So if, if it were just a lot of inert facts that explained themselves and formed their own patterns about any human intervention and so on, then history would be like a telephone book or a, a catalog and you could just yeah. go, or a timeline, you just go yep. look at it and that would be that. But it's finding patterns, finding chains of causation and consequence, um, understanding what is the proper context or the context that context that best explains the, the events in question. That's where the real art, I think, comes into historical analysis. And maybe some science too, but uh, there's a lot of art in it. So uh, an account that's right in the sense that it can, it can never be impeached or never argued with again, and it's just uh, an inert intellectual it's the last bolus word. that's there, the last word. That kind of thing is rare in <laughs> history, and in, in the study of history, and the writing of history, and I'm always suspicious when any work tries to make that kind of a claim. So you asked about my biases. <clears throat> I suppose I have biases of the sort uh, that thinks we are a little bit of a disarticulated, wild and woolly, uh, overly individualistic society, and that we would be more stable, prosperous, happier people if we found more common ground and found a way to express our common desires through the instrumentality of elected representative government, which is one of the great creations of this society in the 18th century. So I guess that makes me politically a Democrat more than a Republican, although I sometimes vote for Republicans too. Um, but that's, it, that, that is, in general, I guess, a bias that I'm conscious of. It's a, it's a value or a set of values sure. that I'm conscious of. And yes, it must inform my work, but I'm not unaware when that bias starts to exert its influence, and I try to check that with whatever means are at hand. One of the challenges I find now when I think about these issues is how tempting it is to play to your, play to your friends, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know what an audience is going to find appealing, uh, and um, there are a lot of narratives. So how does the historian, given that there are many narratives, they're all some more valid than others, some more legitimate than others, but many plausible narratives. How do you choose among them? Or, and let me ask you a bit of more practical question. When you're literally structuring a book that's got this much detail and this, you said it's only 15, 20 years, but it, it's really tumultuous 15, 20 years. It could have been eight times as long, right? <laughs> right? I just, <laughs> it's depressing. Well, thank thought. God it's not. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right? But it could have been. You could have spent your whole life writing on that those 20 years. Sure, yeah. Well, yes. How do you choose? How do you? Um, well, I, I, again, made a fairly conscious choice in writing Freedom from Fear that I was going to focus on those things that endured uh, beyond the 1930s and the 1940s, those things that had consequence in history. Uh, those were going to be my major uh, elements of focus. So, for example, there's a lot less in my book than in some traditional accounts about things like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the yeah. National Recovery Act, and so on, which have a very short shelf life. And yes, there's a lot of romance about them, and they, they were very colorful stories, but they're not really what deeply affected the nature of the society going forward. So that's why I spent a lot more time talking about American grand strategy in World War II than I do in the heroism or valor of any particular kind of battle. Uh, why I spend a lot more time talking about the Social Security Act than I do talking about the Agricultural Adjustment Administration and so on, uh, because I'm really interested. I was interested in writing the book about the things that had consequence yeah. that affected the lives of the next several generations. So that's that was a very conscious choice, and I also made a very deliberate choice uh, to shun. Uh, well, it shouldn't be shun. Puts it too strongly, <laughs> but not to lay much emphasis on popular culture. Uh -huh. Which uh, I've seen other writers get uh, attached to that tar baby. It's colorful stuff. Yeah. It's fun, uh, re recounting movie plots and yeah. 
figures who made the headlines for two weeks in 1938 and never heard of again. Those are great stories and they're all as fun to recite, but they, they don't really have much deep and lasting consequence for the larger society. So there's not much of that kind of thing in my book. What do you think of the, let's close with this, the, there's a lot of, um, I think a lot, a lot of bemoaning of the fact that Americans don't know much history, that particularly this current generation um, thinks that anything before uh, three years ago was something vaguely in the past. Uh, you don't get a feeling that people, at least younger people, read a lot of history. What are your thoughts on how important history is for, say, high school? Um, my daughter took the World History AP exam, and we sat down to go over it together, and we got to the first economics question, and I couldn't answer it. Uh, it didn't make sense to me. I told her that maybe we should skip to a different part of the test. Uh, it was something about discovery of gold in the new world leading to productivity increases or decreases among workers. I had no idea what, it, what economic theory was behind it. Um, what do you think about the teaching of history at high, in the high school level and, and just about the importance of history in general? Well, I think a society that, whose members don't know their own history is like an individual loses his or her memory. You really don't know who you are unless you have some memory of who you've been, where you've come from. So I think it's absolutely important just to a sense of one's place and one's society's place in the world we live in to know something about how we all got here and what, what has shaped us from the past. Uh, and the past is the only sector of human activity from which we have any data. We don't have any data from the future. Yeah, by shame, defi- isn't it? By definition. <laughs> so if we want to study human behavior at all, in any sense whatsoever, we have to look to the past. But, you know, I, I demur a little bit from the, the lamentation that uh, we've lost our uh, historical memory in this country. I mean, I, for, for one thing, I'm quite pleasantly surprised and pleased at what I might call in the publishing industry, founder chic of the last decade or so. Yeah. Several best-selling books true. on I don't, dead, I don't know if people read them, but they do buy them. Dead 18th Which century <laughs> politicians. Yeah, uh, true. There's no other society I know of where people read about 200-year-old political figures with the, with the interest that we do in this society. And another way I see this, um, I served for several years on the Test Development Committee for the Educational Testing Service that, that wrote the Advanced Placement U.S. History exam. You know, I got deeply involved with the workings of the Advanced Placement Program and the Educational Testing Service. And to this day, I teach summer workshops to uh, high school history teachers. And I am so impressed with the professionalism, the dedication of the people who teach the Advanced Placement courses. When I was heading that committee, uh, that's 20 years ago, uh, during that time, early 1990s, the the number of students who took the Advanced Placement U.S. History exam every year topped 100,000. Today, it's close to 400,000. In fact, there might even be 500,000. Well, that tells us something about the effort that's being made at the high school level around the country to do some serious teaching of American history. So I, I, I give our teachers a lot of credit for making that happen. And, and I, there are, you know, I'm picking on the world history exam because I happen to have seen the question, and I, I suspect I'd find the American history exam equally uh, uh, well, not if you were the chair of it. I'm sure I think it would be, it'd be great. But, but I, I think that the question is, do you think it's useful that the last history class that a lot of Americans take is in high school uh, as opposed to taking that class in college, that, that AP? Do you think that's a good thing? Well, no. In, a, in, a, in Besides if, if my party ever comes to power, <laughs> as it were, my educational party, I would mandate more more instruction in history. And in fact, there are some states that do that. In Texas, I believe, you cannot get a degree from a post-secondary institution oh, really? without having taken at least one year of American history. That's true for community colleges and all the public institutions, at least in the Texas system. That's my understanding. So uh, maybe they're onto something down there. <laughs> my guest today has been David Kennedy. David, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.